Thank you for joining the circle of family and friends and coming in and joining us today. Uh, all of us who share the warmth and the wonder and the companionship that Greg extended to each and every one of us over the years. Your presence testifies that you couldn't imagine being anywhere else today, though each of us certainly wishes it was for a very different type of celebration. It's difficult to believe that it's been more than three months since Greg left us. My name is Joe Brenner. I am a crew member of With Grace, the 40-foot J120, and like my fellow crew members here, and I might ask them to raise their hands, we shared many, many wonderful hours aboard with Greg. I remember him certainly for his skill as a sailor, but beyond that, his calm, his collection, and his gentleness, qualities that are not always in extensive supply aboard a sailboat during a race, and that's just part of the reason we appreciate him so much. We're here to celebrate Greg's life, the gift of a friend, who has not merely shared treasured experiences with each and every one of us, that we did just that, but also that of a very special person who elevated each and every one of our lives. The experience of grief is highly personal, as personal, I think, as a fingerprint. Grief counselors have said it's important to understand the difference between curing and healing. Curing means reversing the loss. Healing means growing through it and from it. Only the second one, of course, is an option for us today, recognizing that our time with Greg is an ongoing gift that we can continue to unwrap today, tomorrow, next week, next month, even next year. It's a gift that can endure for a lifetime. We can best appreciate that by expanding our knowledge of the sweep of Greg's 57 years, and for that, some very special people, special to Greg, have agreed to offer some personal reflections. We'll begin with some reflections from Greg's sister, Elizabeth Muller Gross. Elizabeth. Thank you, Jeff. That was lovely. I want to thank everybody here for appreciating my brother. I, did, I thought I'd be introducing myself, Jeff. Uh, thank you. I'm Elizabeth Muller Gross. In our family, we're all called by our full names. So I'm the oldest of four children, and my brother Gregory, who's known to you as Greg here in Seattle, is the youngest. On behalf of my family, I'd like to thank everyone responsible for creating today's celebration of his life, especially Lori Stamper, her husband Marcus, her sister Maria, Chris Johnson, Ken Jones, Jeff Renner, John Knudsen and Mike Besty, and I know that a lot of people pitched in, so thank you very much. We also want to thank Greg's University of Washington friends and colleagues who have been so supportive of our family during this difficult time, especially Jennifer Schaefer, Laura Curtin, and all of Greg's colleagues and Dr. McClellan who wrote my mother notes and sent emails with their remembrances of Greg. Sharing your stories has been incredibly comforting and meaningful to my mother, and we can't thank you enough for that. Gregory lived in Seattle for 24 years. During some of that time, Lori, Marcus, and their families included him in Thanksgiving and Christmas celebrations, and all of you formed a community for him that was so important. Thank you. Many of you commented that Greg was a very quiet and private person, and you therefore don't know about much about his life before he arrived in Seattle. I was asked to provide some background and context for the remembrances that will follow, and some of the photos that you'll see in the slideshow that Ken Kindsliff created. Our parents and grandparents immigrated to New York from Germany. Our parents, Nick and Erica Muller, met while working at Pan American Airlines and had four children, Elizabeth, me, Catherine, Philip, and Gregory. Our father died last year, and Gregory survived by our mother and his three siblings all on the East Coast. We grew up at the beach on Long Island, New York. Because we could fly on standby for free on Pan Am, we spent many summers in Europe visiting our family in Germany. We also spent summers in New Zealand where we could ski during their winter there, and we skied together in Austria, upstate New York, and Massachusetts. But other than the skiing, the rest of us are not athletic, and Gregory had a love of the outdoors that was unique to him. We, he often went off on long hikes and camping trips alone, 
He was quiet, a quiet and gentle child who grew into a quiet teenager with a wry sense of humor. Gregory attended Chaminade High School on Long Island and Colby College in Maine, where he majored in biology and art and graduated in 1985. He began grad school in psychology at the State University of New York in Albany and continued as a doctoral student at the University of Texas in Austin until he stopped pursuing a graduate degree in 1993. The next year, unsure what he should do next, he did something very uncharacteristic for the quiet, gentle person he was. He joined the Army. And um, he served in South Korea, and fortunately for Greg, at Fort Lewis in Washington, which is where he was stationed in 1997 when he completed his three-year Army commitment and got his first job at the University of Washington. This led to Greg settling in Seattle for the rest of his life, and it really was the perfect location for him. During the 24 years of his career at University of Washington, he held research study positions at the Department of Oral Medicine, the Regional Clinic Dental Research Center, the Twin Registry, and then most recently since 2014 at the Department of Cardiology. Seattle was the per perfect place for Greg to land. He threw himself into outdoor activities, starting with backcountry skiing, and then he discovered sailing. He died doing something he clearly loved. Our family thanks you for all the years you were so central to his life here in Seattle. And we, I thank you especially for appreciating my brother. Thank you. Next, we'd like to invite John Knudsen to offer some of his reflections. Greg heard on John's boat, Karina Karina on the South Sound series, and in, I understand six separate Swiftshire races in which they did very, very well. John? Well, hello. I need to say how hard this was for me and my family to hear about what happened. Uh, and it's tough for me to put that behind us. So I, I, I did go over uh, my history with Greg and that, uh, and I, I'm gonna focus on some of the very unusual and crazy things that happened. Uh, first, the 2013, I had a, I called and he was on some ride board for the Swiftsure race. He wanted to go on the Swiftsure race, he'd never done it. I called him and he called me. And I gave him the horror stories about how, how nasty it was going to be and, and how long, 140 miles, and it's going to be forever and we're not going to quit. And the boat is a stripped out host in an ocean racer and it's a difficult time. And all this was okay. It didn't, didn't bother him. And, and then uh, he said, yeah, fine, fine, fine. And uh, he, was, he was all in. And then I said, uh, try to even you know, close the deal. I said, yeah, but the, the bottom, we have it in the boatyard right now. And we're working, the bottom is going to be clean. It's going to be like three days out of the boat yard in durations. And that thing is going to be, it's going to be good to go. And his response was, uh, well, I'll help you. And I was really taken aback because, you know, uh, first of all, I just talked to him on the phone. Now he's going to help me work on a boat, sail in this arduous race. And I said, yeah, well, sure. I had a couple of people who did help me. They were not sailors. We've been doing it for years, but we always need more help. And, you know, some people on the crew did come out, but that was unusual. So he came out, he came out more than once. As a matter of fact, he would come out riding a bicycle, sometimes in the rain, to help us. And this is a, some of you have raced boats and you know what an awful job it is to clean up a 43 foot nasty sailboat underneath. You're taking off the industrial waste space and putting it back on the boat. You're wearing a mask like we are now, except for different reasons. And it's, it's not for everybody, but he helped us more than one occasion and in more than one year he came out. So that was, that was number one. So I was like right on. And uh, so then we decided, he said, well, I'll help you take the boat up to, to Victoria. I'm like, great. And so, and I didn't have anybody to take the boat to Victoria that year. So it was me, Greg, and a guy named John Sparks. And so, um, 
we get on a boat to Seattle, take, we're taking it to Victoria, and and, uh, and they're going, uh, well, uh, do you know where Victoria is? And I said, been there 20 times, yeah. You know, it's dark, and you know, the light's over there, we go by the lights, and it's going to be Victoria. And so we're, we're going along, and it's dark, and all of a sudden, then this big rock or something goes by the right side of the boat. I'm like, what was that? And Greg goes, uh, you're coming into Cabrillo Bay. I said, how do you know that? He goes, well, it's right here on my, on my, on my, on my smartphone. <laughs> I was like, well, what do I do now? <laughs> he said, take a big left turn and go around Charlotte Island and then you'll be in Victoria. And I'm like, okay. <laughs> this is after I'd slowed the boat way down and, you know, recovered my, uh, you know, and then I, I tried to take advantage of all the way saying, you know, this is a good example, you know, people who are experts on the boat, don't ever believe the experts because, you know, your observation is, don't be afraid to speak up, you know, I'm trying to rescue. <laughs> and, and, and so he wasn't, he, he did speak up and, and so we, we went to Victoria and, and so then, um, and, and we, we did this delivery more than once, you know, that was the only time we, well, there's another time I'll get to later, but uh, <laughs> I'm, I'm going to look bad by the time I'm done here. But um, anyhow, we get to Victoria, and, and, and he ordered his food, and we're ordering food, and, and uh, I, I discovered immediately he had wonderful taste in food. In other words, what he liked to order was something I wanted to eat. And so he would order it, and I would say to the weight person, same as him. And they'd go, well, what about the side dishes, sir? And I'd go, yeah, no, the same as him. What about the beverage? Same as him. And, and so, and this repeated, and we didn't just have, we did six Swisher races. We didn't have six meals. We had more like 30 meals because we'd get there Wednesday morning, later Thursday morning early. And so we'd be there for a couple of days working on the boat uh, because sometimes it was messed up. And then we'd do the race, then we'd come back, and then we'd have another meal. So we had lots of meals, probably 30, and almost every time, in fact, every time he'd order, and I'd say, same as him. And then he'd try to psych me out. He'd go, well, uh, what do you want to eat tonight? And I'd go, you know, I really don't know. And I haven't decided yet. And then I'd wait, and he'd you have to order sooner or later. He'd order, and I'd go, same as him. <laughs> and it was like a running joke, so I kept doing that, and I was never disappointed. And uh, anyhow, so after that, uh, that race, we got a, I believe we got a third on that race. And that was the, uh, I think that was the year where we sat out uh, at Reese Rocks in the middle of the night with the spinnaker up against the tide, waiting for the tide to change so we could finish. And the GPS said we would finish at 5.59 and the deadline was 6 a.m. And it, it luck would have it, the tide ended up, we went in, we sat up all night guy from Canada said, uh, I have a winch handle for the first person who says start the engine. <laughs> and that was, the, that was how we did it. We just kept going and finally at 5.24 in the morning we finished and we got the Lanterne Rouge Trophy the next year for being, they call it the Barn Door Trophy, for being the last boat to finish the race. And we were third. And so the next year, was even more spectacular because we took that boat out. We had a wonderful weather leg. One of the things that happened on the weather leg was an example like, like Jeff was saying, that he was quiet and I'm sitting on the weather leg, we're sailing along and, and I was wondering out loud, uh, about four or five hours in the race, Sunday afternoon, on the wind, uh, where's our competition? Where's, where's Hanamari? Where's uh, Night Runner? And uh, everybody kind of gave me a blank look because they had lost track of it. Not Greg. He goes, uh, well, Night Runner is over there about a, about a mile uh, down to Leward. We were on starboard. We were on poor tack, so that, that put him behind us. And Anna Mari is, is quite a bit behind you. And I was like, Greg, how do you know that? He goes, well, it's right here on my tracker. <laughs> <laughs> When are you about ready to share that with us? <laughs> but that's, that's kind of the way he was. He, I, I'm like the guy on the boat that you want him to shut up. He won't stop talking. But Greg was totally the opposite. So we, we got along fine. And uh, so we got out. Uh, it, funny, another funny thing happened on that same race. We're out, it, we're out there. It's 9 o'clock. It's dusk. It's getting dark. There's a big boat comes up from behind us. And it's... Uh, um, 
Mardi Gras. It was uh, Mardi Gras. And uh, Mrs. Mrs. Phelps and Mr. Phelps is at the helm, and we could hear her screaming because Mardi Gras, Mardi Gras, we were both in us. Who is that? Who is that? <laughs> and we were up there with a 60, 66 Raider or something like that, piece of junk, and they had their 18 great, you know, Santa Cruz 52, and they were outraged that we were in front of them. So they tacked over and disappeared, and we tacked over and followed them. And then it got dark, and then there was a J140 in front of us, and I was trying, as we run around, the, uh, Greg and I, actually, as we run around the light ship, 20 miles out, middle of the night, one in the morning, on the back of an ILC-40 that rated like 18, and that back transom was closer than I am to Jeff. I was trying to poke the transom with the front of my boat. We were having this fun. We never did get that close, but we were right on that thing, going around the light ship, put the spinnaker up and went back. Never finished the race, but because we were the first boat in our section, we got a first, and that was our first section one. And then we got another section one after that, when Tatouche followed a uh, Norwegian uh, in the fog, uh, followed a Norwegian cruise ship by saying, we're in an international ocean race and uh, give us room. Uh, well, it was totally against all the rules. <laughs> we're in the BTS lanes and, and you don't do that. And we, we, we saw the thing coming too. We heard the four horns in the fog. We went, oh boy, you know. And we saw this cruise line coming because we were a little bit behind that too. So we tacked out of the way and let them go. And that was it. Well, come to find out, they disqualified tattoos, so we were first again. <laughs> so we had that special magic that sometimes you have with a crew, a bunch of people, and Laurie and Marcus were on all these races. And you get uh, some people together and you have that magic and, and things happen. And so that's the way it was with Greg. You know, it wasn't like he was like Mr. Flamboyant or something, but it was just a the synergy of the people involved, and he was so important with that. So anyway, we, we won that race, and then uh, then another race in the fog, and this was, uh, uh, well, one time, I'll, I'll digress a little bit, that uh, he and I were driving back in the fog at night, and I think he saved our bacon, because we were, it was Sunday night now, it was after some race, we were going back to Seattle, we had left at 11 or midnight or one or something like that, we were tired, and we were going through the Harrow Streets. I was driving very motoring, and Greg went, uh, I was looking at these lights over that way, and Greg goes, uh, you know that's coming at us. <laughs> <laughs> and I was like, oh yeah, <laughs> it is coming at us. And I turned the boat, and that boat went by dangerously close to starboard. And uh, you know, he, he spoke up then. <laughs> I'm not sure what would happen if he hadn't, but that was that was another bad on me. But you know that that that's what that actually happened. Uh, but then the, the the funny part was uh, we're, we're it, oh he had sailed the boat down when I, I made a note in some one of the races before this last race he had sailed the boat down the wind with the spinnaker up, and that boat was going 10, 11, 12 knots, 13 knots, I don't know, but going fast, you know. Uh, we have an expression for it that I won't say, but it was going fast. <laughs> <laughs> and he was driving, and I was like, and I don't usually do this, I went downstairs and I took a nap, because that's how steady it was, how wonderful he was driving. I made a note in my log book about it, and it was like, Great, I went to sleep, I came up, everything was good, we finished the race, and we really got first, second, and third, then. One of the races, we got line honors, one of those second place races, we got line honors, went across the, the finish line, and they shot the gun off, and that's the first time we ever got line honors with this boat, now he was on that when that happened. Hannah Murray beat us on track of time, Right after that, I changed the rating so that it wouldn't happen again. But, <laughs> but, but in the next year, we beat them. <laughs> so anyhow, uh, so we had all these all these adventures, but we're, we're the, and I never really raised his voice except for once, and that was the rock. And when I talk to people about the race, I say, "Do you remember the race?" And oh, I don't know. Do you remember the rock? Oh, I gotta remember the rock. <laughs> so 
we're, it's in fog now. It was the same morning, that morning at 6.30, Terramoto, which is a very well-sailed boat from Seattle, had gone on the race rocks and tore the bottom out so bad that the Canadian Coast Guard had to come out and put balloons on the thing so it couldn't sink. It stayed in the yard for three years after that. Uh, they wrecked their boat in that fog. That's how bad it was, and they were, they were heading for Hind Bank. We were heading for race passage, but we were in that fog. We couldn't see anything. And um, nonetheless, we had this pinnacle up, port pole out, boat was going bad out of hell. And uh, I was driving, and um, I knew the land was in front of me, uh, but I didn't really know where. And finally, Greg was up by the mast and yells back, uh, not yell, but he says, John, there's a rock in front of you. <laughs> <laughs> and I naturally responded, Greg, how big of a rock? <laughs> <laughs> and he lost it, he yelled back. What friggin' difference does it make? <laughs> the rock is! It's a rock in front of you! <laughs> it was the first time. It was the first time I ever got his go. You know? <laughs> and I said, Oh, you know? Yeah, I see it. It's more like an island, though. <laughs> um, jive! Jive now! And we jive the boat, you know? We, we, we get in, and so that was, that was the end of it. But, uh, Anyway, we, we had some fun, and he was irreplaceable as far as I know. The 2019 race, for some reason, he sailed with another boat, sailed boat from Seattle. They didn't finish. He, Marcus, and Lori, and you know, they were getting more races there, so I, I knew that was why they weren't with me. But we all sat in the dock after this race, and they said, gee, I never thought you'd drop out. And I mentally went, you know, if you guys were on my boat, we not, would not have dropped out. We would have won. We would have figured out some way to win that race. And that's, that's what I felt about here. Anyhow, it's, uh, thank you very much for listening to me. Some of you, of course, knew Greg as a colleague. Laura Curtin would now like to share some recollections from his work with her team at the University of Washington. Hello, my name is Laura Curtin, and I work with Greg at the UW Medical Center. Greg had started with the UW Medical Center in 1997, as Elizabeth said, and held a variety of positions before starting with the UW Cardi Cardiology Clinical Trials Unit in 2014 as a research study assistant, and then eventually became a research coordinator. <clears throat> Excuse me. I met Greg when I started with the Clinical Trials Unit in January of 2019. I was Greg's direct supervisor for two and a half years, and over those two and a half years, I got to know Greg through our one-on-one -on -one meetings, team meetings, and team outings, whether it was lunch at a local restaurant or visiting the Burke Museum. Greg was kind, thoughtful, and yes, at times quiet. He also had the ability to tell the most amazing stories. He would draw you in and captivate you with his enthusiasm and details that had you at the edge of your seat waiting for the outcome. Greg had a sharp wit and his stories showcased that. With that in mind, I would like to share a couple of funny stories that involved Greg. The first one entitled Simply Squirrel. So Greg was looking for a kit to prep prior to a study visit. The kit had tubes and vials and was not large. The invoice had stated it had been delivered sometime prior. Um, we had recently moved offices and so we discussed possible locations. So Greg was going to do a deeper dive in locating the kit. A couple of days later, I asked him if he had found said kit. His response was, and I quote, first, since it's Friday, let me tell you a story. And so it began. So apparently, so Greg had read a pop site article a few years back that detailed how some researchers found that when squirrels hide acorns in the fall, they only eat about a third of what they hide. Another third are eaten by other squirrels, and the other third are lost, location forgotten by the squirrel. So Greg had concluded that squirrels hide acorns in the fall and then randomly look for them in the winter and come across the acorns by happenstance. So evidently, when the kit had arrived, Greg had stuck it behind another kit that was going to expire soon and forgot where he put the kit. He found it when randomly looking through other kits and came across the kit by happenstance. He then pronounced, I am that squirrel. <laughs> so of course, Greg
Ray could tell the story much better than um, I ever could, and that was what was great, so great about Greg. His stories were always engaging and funny. He took something as simple as locating a kit and created this great adventure. He had my full attention when telling the story, and when he paused for a fact, I was beside myself. Is there a real squirrel? Or are we talking figuratively? <laughs> Did he find the kit? Did the squirrel take the kit? You know what? <laughs> so he had a way of bringing you into his world and what a glorious place to be. Um, recently, well, this past holiday season, members within the Division of Cardiology had an ugly sweater contest. So the majority of us wore store-bought ugly sweaters. Not great. No simple store-bought sweater would do. He used an old sweater of his. He attached Christmas lights, bike reflectors, light bulbs, whatever he can find. It, it actually uh, partially lit up. So he was quite proud of his creation. It truly was an ugly sweater, and he took home a respectful second place. You might be asking yourself, what sweater could have possibly beaten his? Well, let me tell you. First place was this sweater that had a large picture of a reindeer and a pouch to hold a beer. So this is where the story takes a funnier turn of events because after the contest, I think it was the next day, Greg and I were talking um, and I was congratulating him on coming in second. It was at this time he let me in on a little secret. He himself had voted for that other sweater. <laughs> I was a bit surprised and asked why he didn't vote for his own sweater to win. And he looked at me with a slightly bemused look and simply said, it holds a beer. <laughs> so, <laughs> so that was great. Um, he had a wicked sense of humor. But among all the sorrow and the pain of losing Greg way too soon, there are so many wonderful memories as we've heard today. Um, and those are the ones that I will cherish. Yes, he was quiet, thoughtful, and kind, but he also had a wonderful sense of humor. And that is what I'll miss most of all. To his mother, Erica, and his um, father, who, Nick, who's passed, his sister, Elizabeth, Catherine, and brother, Philip, thank you for sharing Greg with us. It was an honor and a privilege to know him. Next, we'd like to invite Mike Dusty, and I'm told that most of you probably know him simply as Mikey. He'd like to offer some memories, and he raced with Greg on the boat, Magic Button. Mikey. Thanks, Hi, everybody. Greg and I met on the Cal 39 Magic Button, Jim, Jim Hewitson's boat. And Jim's, Jim's here today. I haven't seen Jim for a couple years. You want to put your hand up, Jim? Yeah. There he is. Uh, we sailed on that boat for more than a decade. Uh, after a short while, we found ourselves working primarily bow together. So I spent a lot of time with Greg on the rail. We, we did our job. We made sure the waves hit us and not the rest of the crew. <laughs> Bow's an interesting place. Uh, one of the more dangerous places to be on a boat, a sailboat. If you've ever been clocked by a 22 foot long dip pole or had a sheet or a guy wrapped around your foot on a set or a, or a jibe, uh, you might have a better understanding. Uh, most, if not all, four deck people know, know this, which is why four deck people think a lot. Greg was no exception. Uh, we would always correct each other, um, correct each other's mistakes. We'd be correcting our own mistakes before they became real mistakes. I could count on Greg as my four deck partner and friend, and I did. Greg wasn't a big talker. He was. On the quiet side, as I've gotten to know from everybody, he was like that with everybody. Um, you know, but as the years went by, I think Greg opened up a little bit. He became a little bit more social towards you know, over the last maybe five or six years. He always had a positive attitude. I don't believe I ever saw anything but positive from him on those 
10 years on boats together. Does anybody remember that phase where Greg grew his hair out really long? Okay. <laughs> grew the beard. <laughs> I used to call him Jesus because he looked just like Jesus, right? In all those old Jesus pictures. Uh, you know, Greg didn't drink a lot. He didn't curse a lot. He just, he just kept it cool. He was a cool customer most of the time. Except when everything was going wrong on the, on the Ford deck, you know, <laughs> sometimes. Greg was very reliable. I think we can all agree that he was always there. Um, he was always assisting with deliveries and returns. Uh, one of the most, of course, noticeable characteristics is that, of course, he loved to sail, but I mean, he loved to sail so much. If his primary boat wasn't sailing that Saturday, he was he's, he found a way to get on another boat. He was always on boats. It's, it's amazing how many boats Greg sailed on. Um, uh, Magic Button was mostly his primary starting boat, I think. I, I know he did a lot of UW um, sailing, but uh, crew of Shada, um, Shada crew, raise your hand. You guys, you guys had Greg quite a bit, mostly on Wednesdays, because we didn't do Wednesdays. Uh, Magic Button crew, got a pretty good showing from Magic Button today. But, uh, you know, it really was amazing how many boats Greg got on. I'd be out there and I'd, there's Greg. <laughs> anyway, Greg, Greg Mueller, Mueller <laughs> was truly a sailor, and I will miss him. God bless you, Greg. Well, we thank each of you for sharing your recollections. If comfortable, if any of you would like to share a word, a phrase, a sentence or two uh, about how you most treasured Greg in your friendship and shared experiences, uh, don't feel compelled to do so, but if you'd like to, stand up, remain seated, seated, and just share a couple of thoughts if you'd like to. Oh, one story share about Greg. Hi, my name is Igor, and I met Greg sailing at uh, Washington Yacht Club. Uh, he was great, uh, great person uh, to have in Washington Yacht Club. He was. Uh, Killboat fleet, uh, killboat fleet captain for many years and took care of uh, all the boats at the club, uh, fixing them and uh, putting in many, many hours uh, to work on the boats. And we had the tradition of taking boats for Christmas ship parade um, in the winter. And uh, one of the years, um, I don't remember quite, I think it was 2015 or 14, we took um, kill boats uh, for Christmas ship parade and it was just two two of us. Greg was keeping one boat and I was keeping an hour boat and it was on 23rd of uh, December, just the day before Christmas. Uh, and the day before Christmas, Christmas ship parade usually happens on Lake Union and um, it's just like a zoo. There are lots of boats and it's dark at night and it was cold and rainy, very cold and rainy. and um, we went out uh, and I was skipping an outboard. It had an outboard. And uh, right after right, right after the parade, and I think maybe we had fireworks, I don't quite remember. Right after the parade, one of the boats backed and hit our outboard and we broke a fuel line. And I didn't have a Greg's phone number. And the only phone number I had is some other person in the club. And it was already like 10, 13 naming and uh, we were floating with only fuel left in the carburetor and soon we we're going to run out of uh, fuel and carburetor and the boat would be just without sails and um, who knows what's going to happen. So I tried to get close to the shore to drop an anchor and try to figure out what I do next and I had to start calling members of the club to figure out Greg's phone number. So eventually <laughs> uh, people reached Greg but he had to take first the boat back to uh, Union Bay, uh, put it away, it's uh, Cal 30, um, Cal 33, 
I think it was Kafka TV, um, put away the boat and uh, had to come out to Lake uh, Union to save us in the wheeler. And um, it took quite a bit of time. It took more than an hour because it was about freezing temperature and it was really hard for him to start the wheeler. He said that it took him 15 minutes to start the wheeler. But yet, the uh, night before the Christmas, he did come and help us um, because I didn't have any other plan. I had to rely on Greg. And everyone was really cheerful and grateful for that uh, commitment of um, nice thing committed by Greg. Thank you. Thanks. So, um, so I knew Greg at the Washington Yacht Club and um, I got promoted to head fleet captain. It just meant that you heard of all the problems. Greg was the guy who called to solve the problem. And uh, one of the things that I really appreciated is um, really good sailors have a real problem with a boat that I call deception. It's, uh, it's always decorated. You, you give it a theme and I try to decorate it. And in its early years of being decorated, Greg was willing to come on board. And I said, hey, we got a new name. We're Canard Noir. And that means black duck. And if any guys know about the duck ducks, the black duck is either given for something stupid or given as, wow, that was pretty awesome. And uh, I thought, wow, this is our chance to finally win a gold of duck because I got Greg on the crew here. And uh, we were at the start line. And darn it, this lady's boat, sorry, sorry, go girl went right across the whole start line. And so I got one of my great videos is Greg dealing with a shot start. We still got fourth place or something, but no, no colorful duck that year. <laughs> but anyways, he was really gracious to come on board the decorated boat. And uh, that's why I appreciate him a lot. Thanks. Um, I'm Marilyn Roden, and uh, Greg worked with me for 11 years at the University of Washington School of Dentistry in the Dental Research Center, where he was a research coordinator for us. And um, he was delightful to work with. I really relied on him. Our job was to implement studies, and we get these NIH grants that have like a paragraph that tells you um, what to do, and we kind of have to you know, put the rest of the the rest of the study together. And so he was wonderful to consult with on the procedures um, because of his background. So the main thing I wanted to share is um, his majors in art and biology really came together then. So uh, he actually is quite the artist and very creative. I don't know how many people know that. But if you um, take the bus uh, you know, to the UW, you've probably seen his ads for research studies on those buses. So he would create a lot of uh, the recruitment materials for us. Um, and one study we did was a chewing gum study um, on xylitol, and so it was the gum study. And he had these great designs for um, the gum that we gave people, the containers and um, the ads and so on. So anyway, that was just one of his um, many attributes that I wanted to, to share with everybody. So. He was a wonderful colleague, as, as Lauren knows. Thank you. Hi, I'm Mark Lippering. For those of you who don't know me, uh, Greg uh, was crewing on our boat for the last uh, two, three years very heavily. And uh, we always appreciated him. The one thing that I want everybody to uh, share with you is that I think the one word that I think of is resourceful. Greg was resourceful. Whenever there was a problem on the boat, something that didn't work or we were missing a part, he was able to make it happen. The other thing that in his resourcefulness was he only chose what he needed. He didn't live exorbitantly. He would ride his bike down to Shilshul. The one time that he thought he would, he was running late this spring, he drove his car and he ran out of gas because he never, <laughs> he never wanted to fill that tank. He just wanted what he needed. 
and so he was great. Uh, when we would have races, he would, like I say, he was always solving the problems. He's the guy on the bow of the boat. He's the first one across the line. He's telling you that you're over early or you've got room. Uh, he was uh, making decisions like that. And, and like has been said, being a four deck is not easy. You're usually trying to hold on to the boat while you're rigging the boat. It's not an easy task. And Greg was excellent at it and we're going to miss it. But the, the one thing I will say about his demeanor was always very cordial, nice, laughing. But if things were followed up and, and Chris would say, it's time to tack, he would turn around and he would look you in the eye and he would say, no, we're not tacking. We cannot tack. Now you cannot do it. And so we knew that we weren't going to tap. So anyway, uh, like I say, Greg was so, so much fun to be with and part of our boat. And I, I was lucky uh, when we would do race week when I was at Oak Harbor, uh, Greg would just have his camping equipment. He would sleep right down at the boat, right on the docks where, you know, after you've been on a boat all day, do you really just want to sleep in a tent? But uh, he did. And uh, this year, the venue had changed and I was at a location where we were all together. He still had his tent. Mm -hmm. He had everything set up. He, was, he had every piece of equipment, but just what he needed, not more than what he needed. And I had the fortune of being able to talk with him after our first day of racing. And uh, I, I got to talk to with him, just he and I, for over an hour. It was probably one of the first times I'd ever talked to him. I mean, you talk to somebody when you're sitting on the rail, but this was different. We were talking about everything. And uh, it was just such a pleasure to get to know him. I was looking forward to so much more time with him. And uh, he's going to be sorely missed. Well, it struck us as we were preparing for this that often when somebody has left us, we like a way to memorialize them, to show our appreciation, uh, to pay it forward, as it were. Uh, so we should mention that if you do wish to honor your friendship with Greg, totally voluntary, by making a memorial gift, that you consider a supporting donation to one of the two organizations listed on the inside cover of the program. The Washington Yacht Club, which Greg supported in so many ways to introduce University of Washington students to sailing, or Puget Soundkeeper. The address for the club is inside the program, and we're asked or it's suggested to please a note, uh, attach a note to any such gift identifying it as being in the memory of Greg. Gifts to Puget Soundkeeper may be made online and can easily be identified there as a memorial gift. So again, both of those potential Recipients are listed inside the program. We each have our own point of reference, our own way of dealing with the difficult challenges and questions of life that are quite simply beyond our capacity to understand. Recognizing that perhaps we could take just a few moments of silence to quietly and gently form an interior personal wish, meditation, prayer, or blessing for Greg at this time. Knowing that, like Greg, we are so much more than mere matter, physical stuff. As a friend of mine once put, we ultimately are energy and therefore collectively carry light in all the colors of the rainbow and beyond. May we recognize that while we are not part of his biological family, except of course for Elizabeth, we are now part of his extended family, what the seafaring Hawaiian culture describes as Ka Ohana and therefore that we now truly carry part of that rainbow that we knew as gray. I once was told that our sense of loss is best healed, not cured, by asking three questions of our friendship experience with those who have gone forth from us. Who they were for us, 
What gifts do they bring into our lives? And how can we now say thank you? We could offer no greater gratitude for the blessing of Greg's friendship than to answer those questions as we go our separate ways, not just today, but in the days to come. We'll now conclude the formal part of this memorial, this celebration, with a video produced and edited by Ken Jones, who has spent so many hours racing with Greg aboard with Grace. Ken Samuelson composed and performed the music. The video is entitled, Sailors Remember. KJ is going to provide a few words, but before we do that, let me mention at the conclusion, please feel free to remain and share your memories informally. Food is going to be provided over there. The programs are in the back. Only a few, because of space considerations, will be able to go aboard with grace at the conclusion of this ceremony to release this wreath, gotta get my directions correct, at Meadow Point, which was often the northernmost point of the Monday Night Race series that Greg so often participated in. However, all of you are invited to observe from the beach. Thank you so much for sharing your presence and your affection for Greg. KJ, tell us about your video. Circles. We all have circles. We have a circle that is family. We have a circle that includes our friends. And many of us here in this room have a circle that includes those with whom we sail. For Greg Mueller, that circle was especially large. Over the years, he crewed on dozens of boats and alongside hundreds of sailors. We all remember him in our own special way. Uh, this is just a sample of memories from a few of sailors. Uh, my name is Kerem. Sailed with Greg. Uh, I've known him for close to 15 years. Uh, I sailed with him on Stomp Dancer, Magic Button, and uh, a lot on uh, Rascal on Duck Dodges. <music> Duck Dodge is not a very serious race, but we were trying to be competitive, and then uh, we did really well as a team together. Uh, and we won a lot of ducks, and, but we also partied a lot, either during the race or after the race. Greg was always very good about dressing up for the theme of tonight. He wore a lot of costumes, he decorated the decorated rascal. Uh, a lot of fun was had. Sailing was his life. 
I'll miss him dearly. My name is Steve Kodish. I sailed with Greg on primarily on Magic Button, uh, also on Grayling and Stomp Dancer. Uh, I don't remember exactly when Greg came on board. Uh, I think somebody brought him. I, I sailed on Magic Button for about 16 seasons, and I remember it seems like Greg was always there. Greg was a four deck. He loved being on the four deck, and uh, he was he was good. He was good four deck crew. He was a he was a very simple man. Um, he he didn't need much in terms of creature comforts. Uh, he enjoyed riding his bicycle. He enjoyed good food. He enjoyed cooking, which we learned. One time we did a race and he showed up with sous vide steaks that he browned with a blowtorch on board the boat. It was spectacular. Uh, he uh, enjoyed people, friends, uh, but mostly he enjoyed sailing. He enjoyed racing. And in Seattle, in this, between April and November, you could race pretty much every day of the week. And, and Greg pretty much did. Uh, he, he, would, he would be racing on one boat one day and another boat the next day, and, and he was in high demand. So I, I think that he, that was absolutely his favorite thing to do in the whole world was to be out on, on a sailboat. Uh, my name is Marcus Thor. I um, sail on with Grace, the J120. Serious business right here. <laughs> Greg was really kind. Dramatic sailor, uh, always um, planning, thinking about what to do next, knowing what needs to happen. Snug the jib halyard, please. Thank you. A pretty calm voice, calm demeanor, as I said, um, but he also had this extra gear, a voice that he could use when we were sailing. So if something had to happen, um, a line needs to be released and what have you, he could turn on his Greg voice, we called it. And most of the Puget Sound um, ended up knowing that we had to release the tack line. You go hoist, we hoist or what are we doing? Get out of here, guys! We did a lot of Swiftures uh, together. Coming back in the night was only me, Lori, and him on deck um, for hours. We realized afterwards that we might have been sleeping, both of us at the same time. Yeah, it was it was uh, it was an interesting experience. Really miss him. Yeah. Oh yeah. You know the boat. You betcha. Okay. Let oh let's go around this way. Right through here. There you go. Yeah. That's right. Can you uh, can you load up here? My, my name is Chris Johnson. I'm a skipper on With Grace. We sail out of Shell Shoal here at uh, Seattle. So we sail with uh, eight people on, on With Grace. Most of those people are return people. We don't have too many fill-in type people, but uh, we're able to recruit them as needed. For, for some of the races.
Well, Greg, Greg was the most mild-mannered. <laughs> I, uh, I couldn't believe we could totally mess up back here. Well, we lost our seat. And he would come back and not not say a thing about it. You know, he was like so forgiving. So that was that was very nice. And uh, he he always seemed very mild mannered about everything, and that that uh, was very appreciated. Yeah, these guys are screwed. We don't need to worry about them. He was a perfectionist. Yeah, you're just making it so cute. Set up the spinnaker ahead of time so he had enough time to check it all out and uh, wanted to have things just right whenever he could. Lazy sheet coming around, sorry. Without his expertise, we were hurting, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, he'll be missed. I sailed the seas Since I was young Beneath the moon and stars into the sun I've been wherever the great whale blows I call my home the blue meadow and I'll not sail these seas no Lay me to rest on this ragged shore. This brigantine would spear the stars. Her moonlit sails would light the dark. She'd dip and glide But she can't fight The black rock night And I'll not sail My ship no more Lay me to rest On this ragged shore Greg set the sails He jibed the kite The jibs he chose Were always right He ran the bow With grace and skill We remember him now Ragged shore.